Your friend.
morning. Happy Mother's Day to all you moms out there. Thank you for all the, the work that you put in, all that you do. And so um, in honor of Mother's Day, we're going to take a little break from Acts 19 this morning and instead look at family. Not exactly a Mother's Day message, but I just thought it'd be a good time to look at the, the family and what Jesus has to say about the family. So let me pray and then we'll get into it. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this opportunity to get together and get into your word. And I pray that you would uh, just help us to continue to grow in your word, um, to think biblically, and to be faithful to you until the time that the Lord Jesus takes us home. pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, excuse me. Uh, this morning, again, we're going to be taking a little break from Acts and from Mother's Day. I want to focus on family, but focus on family through the lens of Scripture. I want to start by defining family in a couple of ways. A family can be de I'm sorry, defined as a basic social unit consisting of parents and their children, uh, considered as a group, whether dwelling together or not, the traditional family. Or any group of persons closely related by blood, such as parents, children, uncles, aunts, and cousins. And so in addition to these definitions of the family, we often hear of other groups referred to as families, whether co-workers or sports teams or military units are often referred to as families. Anyone has that close bond together. As we think about these definitions, <clears throat> we're aware that our nation, you know, for the last 15, 20 or more years has been in the midst of a culture war over what constitutes a family. Long-held ideas regarding the family are being challenged by those whose agenda is in conflict with biblical and traditional values. And so in light of these facts, it's helpful for us as believers to come back to the scriptures, to re-examine our own beliefs regarding the family in light of what the Word of God has to say. And what the Bible has to say about family is very interesting. It's often different from how we would define it. And so it's this subject that we're going to delve into today as we examine the last five verses of Mark chapter 3. So that's what we'll be going today in a message I've entitled, We Are Family. We're going to be looking at Mark chapter 3, verses 31 through 35. So if you haven't opened up your Bibles there, would you go ahead and do so? And as you're turning there, would you follow along as I read this passage that we'll be studying this morning? So there in Mark chapter 3, starting in verse 31... We read, then his brothers, and it's speaking of Jesus, Jesus' brothers and his mother came, standing outside, they sent to him, calling him. <clears throat> and a multitude was sitting around him, and they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. But he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brothers? And they looked around in a circle at those who sat about him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and mother. So we're going to spend our time focusing on three sections this morning. We're going to see, first of all, family visit, and we'll spend a little bit of time there. Then we'll see family announced in just a short moment in that section. And then we'll spend quite a bit of time in family redefined, our final section. So let's move into our first section, and that's family visit. We find that this in verse 31. I think it's fair to say that surprise family visits are a mixed bag. It's likely that we've all experienced good visits from family that has been surprised, and we've all had uncomfortable surprise visits from family. We understand that uh, within you know our, our human families. You know, I was thinking about one of these surprise visits. It was a long time ago now. It was my first year of college. I was uh, going to school at Texas A&M Galveston, and it's days before before you know, Skype and FaceTime and all those things. And so I was missing my family. I decided, you know, on a, on a Friday that I was going to drive home after classes, didn't tell my parents there. And um, my parents were really involved in the high school where I went to, to school. And, and they was served there, worked there for a long time. Well, I knew my dad would be announcing the football game. I knew my mom would be selling tickets in one of the ticket booths going into the game. And so I came in and asked to buy a ticket at her booth and she was really excited and came out running out to hug me and it was a cool surprise visit. Um, I don't know that I've have done anything nice since then but I, I did at that moment uh, was thoughtful back in, in 1993. 
Um, and so it was a, it was a wonderful time. It's a good memory for me of, of just getting to go home and, and see my family. And so um, that was a good family visit. And like, like, likewise, as we get into our passage this morning, we're going to see that Jesus' family is praying him, uh, sorry, is paying him a surprise visit as well. But unlike my visit to Robstown during that first semester of college, Jesus' family isn't coming to see him because they miss him. So to see what I mean, would you please look back a few verses? We need to get a little context. Would you look back there in Mark chapter 3 to verses 20 and 21? So Mark 3 verses 20 and 21, it says, Then the multitude came together again, so they could not as, so much as eat bread. But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him, and they said, he is out of his mind. Now, here's a problem here. His own people refers to his family, and that phrase, lay hold of him, it's actually a word that's used of the arrest of John the Baptist. It speaks of a, a grabbing hold of somebody. It's, it's when you think about someone in a football game, you know, that offensive lineman holds a guy and takes him to the ground. It's, it's kind of that idea. So Jesus' family at this point thinks that he's crazy. they thinking that he's having delusions of grandeur, that he's out of his mind. So they're actually going to go after him to physically take him by force and bring him back to Nazareth, Nazareth so he can just kind of you know settle down and not make a fool of himself. So as we put all these pieces together, we realize that the Lord Jesus' physical family was on their way from Nazareth to Capernaum to pay him a surprise visit. And unfortunately, Jesus' family was convinced that Jesus was out of his mind. And they were determined to physically restrain him and take him back to Nazareth. Now, as we continue our study um, back in verse 31, we see that Jesus' family members have arrived in Capernaum now. Verse 31, notice, Then his brothers and his mother came. Now, it's interesting to note that some ancient manuscripts actually record that Jesus' sister came on this surprise visit as well. And that's intriguing. Now, we don't know the names of the sisters, but we do know the name of Jesus' mother, and that's Mary, of course. And we know the name of Jesus' brothers. According to Matthew 13, verse 55, and Mark chapter 6, verse 3, these brothers were named James... Joseph, Simon, and Judas. Now it's also interesting to note that there are nine New Testament verses that explicitly refer to the fact that the Lord Jesus had brothers. Now of course these would be half-brothers, different father, same mother. But this is important and the reason why I bring this out here in this study is it's very important because it shows that the Roman Catholic dogma of the perpetual virginity of Mary is a false doctrine that is not supported by the Bible. You see, Scripture makes it clear that after the birth of Jesus, Joseph and Mary had normal marital relations, and they had at least four sons and an unknown number of daughters. Now, that's very important, because people have built these false doctrines, again, the perpetual virginity of Mary, and, well, let me pray to Mary, and and, and that's going to get some things done. And, and that's a false doctrine about Mary. Okay? And, and it points out the fact to us that we need to have scriptural support for what we believe. Now for many of us, and I know for me growing up, then I was, you know, didn't grow up as a believer. And so what happened is I was looking for you know, kind of what's this world all about and why should, how should I do things and why should I do things. And so those influences came from many areas through the movies I watched and you know, the, the TV shows and the music and magazines and books. And so I have all these different views coming in. And then when you come to the scripture, you have to say, are those views true or false? Well, none of that's changed. Whatever we watch, whatever kind of media we consume, whatever we look at on social media, we have to be careful about those messages that are being communicated to us. And we have to ask ourselves and look at the scriptures and say, does this line up with what Scripture say? Please realize that whatever we you know, le listen to or read, there's, there's always an agenda. There's always a philosophy behind that. And so it's our job as believers to say, hmm, is this accurate or inaccurate? Does this line up with the Scriptures or does it not? We have to be wise. So many people, we just take in whatever people tell us and not compare it with the Scripture. So let us learn the Scripture 
Let us compare whatever message we're getting with the message of Scripture and say, well, is it true or is it not? Because the Scripture is the lens through which I'm going to judge the world. So I'm going to judge these messages and these ideas. And that's, that's vital for us to do. All right, let's continue on now. And it's important that we remind ourselves at the time of this surprise visit here in Mark chapter 3, remember Jesus' brothers had not yet placed their faith in him. That's important. Jesus' brothers had not yet become believers at this point. And so to prove my point, would you turn forward a couple of books to uh, the Gospel of John? We're going to look at John chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. John chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, we read, After these things Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand, and his brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Notice, for even his brothers did not believe him. So at this time, the the physical brothers of Jesus, those half-brothers of Jesus, they didn't believe him. They didn't believe him. And so... Um, thankfully, we know from the rest of the New Testament that Jesus' brothers did not remain in unbelief. We understand that sometime after Jesus' resurrection, that at least two of Jesus' brothers placed their faith in him. They became born-again believers. In fact, Jesus' brother James would become the leader of the early church in Jerusalem and would write the book of James. Then Jesus' brother Judas would go on to write the book of Jude. And so it's important for us as we kind of look at this and think about it for just a minute. Jesus is God incarnate. He is God in human flesh, and yet his physical family, before his resurrection, didn't believe in him. His brothers didn't trust in him. And so I'm going to give you encouragement, give me encouragement, that if we have unbelieving family members that we, we take heart from the fact that even Jesus' own family didn't believe in him. So Jesus, of course, is going to be the greatest witness of all time. And so even if there are people who rejected his witness within his family, then we realize there are going to be people within our family who reject that witness as well. But we also see that his you know, members of his family came to salvation. And so for us, there's just that exhortation. We don't know how it's going to turn out. We don't know if our, when or if our family members are going to turn to the Lord. But the exhortation for us as we kind of look at this story is to continue praying for and witnessing to our unbelieving family members. They may be hostile to us now. You know, they, they may just maybe ignore us. Whatever the case may be, just keep praying. Just keep witnessing. Um, just, just keep on reaching out to those unbelieving family members. You don't know. Um, you don't know when the Lord is going to move or they're going to respond. You, don't, you just don't know. We don't know. So I'd encourage you to keep on praying for and witnessing for those unbelieving family members. It's beautiful to see how members of Jesus' family came to salvation and the influence they've had throughout the history of the church. And, and so it's important for us to, just to, to keep hope alive, uh, to keep praying, keep witnessing. Now as we turn back to Mark chapter 3, it must be admitted that we can't be sure what Mary thought of Jesus' ministry as she and her sons came to take hold of Jesus. You know, maybe she was a passive participant in the expedition, or or maybe she actively wanted to stop Jesus because she feared for her safety, and that's understandable. You know, no mom wants her her son in harm's way. Well, either way, Mary and her sons and daughters were clearly in the wrong as they sought to disrupt Jesus' public ministry. They're going directly against Christ here. And so this is not where a person needs to be. Let's continue on in verse 31. It said, Then his brothers and his mother came standing outside. And so because of this great multitude that was surrounding Jesus there in the house of Peter and Andrew, well, Jesus' family is unable to get to him. They're unable to make their way through the crowd. So it says they sent to him calling him. So Jesus' family sends a message to Jesus that they're waiting outside. And we think about this from purely a human way and kind of a cultural way. We think, well, as soon as Jesus gets this message, surely Jesus is going to come out and see them. You know, it's, it's his, his family's outside, his mom, his, his, his brothers, possibly his sisters. 
they're out there. Surely once Jesus says that, he's going to just tell everybody inside, hey guys, let's take a break, let's take a quick time out, I'm going to go talk to my family for a minute. However, Jesus responds to this message from his family in a wholly unexpected way. And that's how Jesus does things. He's the king of the unexpected. And we're going to explore that response in our last section. But for now, let's move from family visit to our second section. And that's family announced in verse 32. Notice, and a multitude was sitting around him. So here again, we see there's a large group of individuals sitting around Jesus as he teaches them, as he shares with them. And, and uh, we see right here, they're not doing any social distancing. There's a bunch of them packed in here. And so from what we will see in verses 34 and 35, it's likely that this multitude here, it included the 12 disciples that Jesus had chosen, those 12 that were with him as he did ministry, and many others who also considered themselves to be followers of Jesus that were packing out the house and wanted to hear from the Savior. So it's in the midst of this meeting um, that the messengers from Jesus' family make their way through the crowd to the Lord. And we read, and they said, so there's some messengers, and they said to Jesus, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. Again, at this point, we would expect Jesus to drop everything and to go out and greet his family. This would seem like the right thing to do. But again, the Lord Jesus is the master of the unexpected. And we're going to see this quite clearly as we move from family announced now to our final section and that's family redefined, and we find this in verses 33 through 35. But he answered them saying, who is my mother or my brothers? It's very interesting. I clearly remember studying this section of scripture when I was working at Camp Champions uh, there in the, the late 90s. And uh, trying to kind of process through, and what is Jesus saying here? What does he mean by this? And what's going on? And and as I read this, it was kind of surprising to me as I tried to figure out what Jesus was talking about. Now, not only does Jesus fail to go outside, as we see here in verse 33, he fails to go outside and greet his family who have made this trip to see him. He actually asks the multitude around him a very perplexing question. He says, who is my mother or my brothers? I think about that. Put yourself in the sandals of those disciples that were sitting around Jesus in this packed house as Jesus gets this message that his mother and brothers are outside. And he says, who are my mother and my brothers? Or who is my mother and my brothers? And think about what the disciples must have thought. Like, well, is Jesus feeling okay? You know, does he have low blood sugar? We Should we get him something to eat? It doesn't seem like he can remember who his mother and his brothers are. This must have been very confusing for the disciples. It seems certain that those sitting around Jesus must have been confused by Jesus' question and by his behavior. That he's asking who his mother and brothers are, that he's not going out to see them. Well, as we seek to make sense of Jesus' question, there are a couple of lines of reason that we should consider. First of all, maybe Jesus refused to go out and meet his family because he knew that they would physically, or they would try to physically restrain him and drag him back to Nazareth. Maybe he refused to go outside because he was avoiding a scene, right? He didn't want to have to, to you know, have a physical confrontation with his family. You know, maybe his mom would have been there and his brothers hiding around the corner and tackled Jesus and tried to drag him off, and maybe he was avoiding that scene. Maybe. However, it seems more likely that Jesus was using this circumstance as a teachable moment for his disciples, for all those that were gathered in front of him. You see, Jesus was about to reveal the paradigm-destroying truth to the, those individuals sitting around him. In a culture that valued family above nearly everything else, Jesus was about to teach something that would be considered highly subversive. You see, Jesus answered his own question, as he often did, this question of who is my mother or my brothers, with these words in verse 34, and he looked around in a circle at those who sat about him, and he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Well, this is another wow moment, because the Lord Jesus is essentially redefining the family. It's very important for us to understand. You see, according to the Lord Jesus, and according to the scriptures, 
Family is something more than what you're born into. It's something that you're born again into. Let me say that again. Family, from a scriptural point of view, from the focus of the Bible, is more than something you're born into. It's something that you're born again into. Now, it is true that those that you share genetics with, that those you share blood with, are your family. But there's also a greater family, and that's a spiritual family. So the scriptures make it clear that the spiritual family takes priority over the physical family. Now, many of us have that tremendous blessing of our physical family also being our spiritual family. That we've been born into a family, but those members of that family have been born again as well. And so we're a physical family and a spiritual family. That we're a family here on earth, but we'll be a family in heaven as well because we're sons and daughters of God. And so that's an awesome thing. But what Jesus is making clear is that that spiritual family, those who share God as their father, are more important that take priority than a physical family. Now thinking about this, I want to read to you what the Apostle John wrote in John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. We read, As many as received Jesus, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. See, this is vitally important. Unless a person receives Jesus Christ as, as, as their Savior and Lord, that they, they receive Jesus as who he is, they trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation, they can't be born again. But the mor moment that they're born again, they become a child of God. So here's the problem. If you're a member of a physical family, but that physical family, there's individuals there who have not yet trusted in Christ, well, they don't have God as their father, okay? And so the, until they do, they can't be a part of that spiritual family. And what often happens, and we understand this, is when it comes to a, a physical family and a spiritual family, that if there's a father who's unsaved, then he doesn't want to do things according to God's way of doing things. Well, then that, that physical child of that father has a choice to make. Am I going to obey my earthly father or my heavenly father? And there, of course, is going to bring conflict there. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but the scriptures make it clear, and let me say in no uncertain terms, that the spiritual family takes priority over the physical family. That the spiritual family, that God is our Father, and He is the Father who must be obeyed above all. Now, as we continue on in verse 35, we see the Lord Jesus' explicit redefinition of the family. Notice, for whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and mother. So here the Lord Jesus makes it clear that he is redefining the family on spiritual terms. In other words, the Lord Jesus views the family in terms of faith, not blood. Or faith, not genetics. Now I believe that Jesus is teaching his disciples that the spiritual family of a believer again takes precedence over the natural family of a believer. And this may be shocking to some of us. It's very countercultural in some areas. You know, maybe some of us have been raised to believe that family comes before all else. And there are countless things in media, you know, throughout human history, that it's all about the family. But Jesus seems to be contradicting that notion of physical family above all else. And this is not the only place where Jesus teaches this sort of thing. This is something that he taught very clearly. So to prove my point, would you turn left one book to Matthew? I want to look at Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 37. Matthew 10, starting in verse 34, Jesus says, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And so both here in Matthew 10 and in Mark 3, the Lord Jesus seems to be redefining family first and foremost in spiritual terms. 
And so it's, it's important for us to really come to grips with that, that the spiritual family must take priority, that our first allegiance is to God the Father and whatever he says to do. And, and it really clears up a lot of things for us when we do that. Now understand it could be difficult in some families, you know, if a family members are strongly against Christ and, and you start following Christ, it's going to be, it's going to cause conflict. It's going to cause trouble, but for us, our allegiance is to God the Father. And so this is what Jesus is saying, that we, he has to be first, we have to love him first. Now the wonderful thing and the often overlooked and kind of the, the controversy of this passage is the fact that when we truly follow God as our Father, when we truly walk in obedience to Him, we're going to be much better family members. We're going to be people who you know, love God and love others. We're seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. We're forgiving our enemies. We're praying for those who persecute us. So the fact of the matter is, when we make the spiritual family a priority, we're going to be better physical family members. We're, we're going to be the best. Or if we're going to be those who, who are, are what we are called to be, what we are created to be. So don't fear that if you follow Christ more closely, you know, that you're going to be a bad family member. It will. It can, can cause strife. Because if you're going after the Lord and your family members aren't, well, then obviously that's going to cause a division. But you can know that you're going to be the best physical family member possible as you're the best spiritual family member possible. As you follow the Lord, as you seek the Lord and seek to serve God with all your heart and soul, mind and strength, you're going to be a much better physical family member. So put the priority on the spiritual. Put the priority on God the Father, seeking after Him, serving Him. And what's going to happen is you're going to be a greater blessing to your family, whether they realize it or not. Now, let's go, let's go ahead and turn back to Mark chapter 3, verse 35. We'll continue on. Notice, for whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. So the most critical part of this verse, the key to understanding what Jesus is saying, is found in those words, whoever does the will of God. And in just a moment, we're going to spend some time breaking down whoever does the will of God, that, that phrase. But for now, I want to point out the fact that Jesus' family was not doing the will of God at this point in time. That's a really important thing to note. You see, Jesus' family was trying to stop him. They were trying to stop the ministry of the Lord Jesus and the things that God the Father had called the Lord Jesus to. His family was actually in opposition. And whatever their motives were, maybe they're trying to spare Jesus because they think that he's crazy, or whatever their motives were, they were wrong, and they were actually working in opposition to God because they hadn't trusted in what God the Father had said. They hadn't realized that Jesus was the Messiah. And because Jesus' family failed to align themselves with the will of God, the Lord Jesus chose to not respond to their request. Because they were in opposition to God the Father, then Jesus says, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do what you guys are asking me to do. And we see this same principle played out in a, in a slightly different way in Acts chapter 4. So would you turn forward a few books to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 4, verses 13 through 20. Here, you know, um, Peter and John have, have healed the guy. And, and there's, they've, they've gotten a hearing. They're sharing the truth of the scriptures with people. And, and the religious leaders don't like it. So they're trying to get them to stop. So Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 13, it says, And now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. They marveled, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Okay, so these religious leaders, they see Peter and John, and they're sharing the truth, and like, man, these guys, what's going on here? They realize that they were Jesus' disciples. It says, And seeing the man who had been healed standing with him, they could say, stay, say nothing against it. So this is a guy who had been you know, paralyzed, and Peter healed him. And so there's this, this truth of this miracle is, is right there for them. Uh, verse 15, But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them, 
that from now on they speak to no man in this, his, this name. So they all called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So here we have a similar thing. Just as Jesus was unwilling to submit to his mother and his brothers when they wanted to, to kind of dislodge him from his ministry because his mother and his brothers weren't aligning themselves with the plan of God the Father, so it is here in Acts 4 that Peter and John have been given a commission, the Great Commission, to go out and share the gospel. And so these religious leaders are saying, don't do that. Shut it down. Don't talk anymore. And they're saying, Peter and John are saying, we can't listen to you because to listen to you would be to disobey God the Father. We can't do that. We are going to do the things that God the Father called us to do. So it's very important. When we have conflict between our physical family and our spiritual family, and if our physical family is telling us to do something different than what God the Father is telling us to do, then we must obey God the Father. We must listen to what God the Father says and disobey that physical family or those, you know, those governmental authorities or whoever it is that tells us to do something different than what our Heavenly Father tells us to do. We must obey our Heavenly Father. That's the key. And I've, I've taught this principle to my children, you know, and, and they've heard it countless times. And I tell them this, hey, as long as I'm telling you to do something that doesn't conflict with the Bible, you just need to obey me as your parent. But if I tell you to do anything that conflicts with what God says, then you obey God, don't obey me. Okay? And so that's an important principle for us to have as, as physical fathers, earthly fathers, earthly mothers, is to say, hey, you obey me as long as I'm lined up with the Lord. But if I ever say something different than what the Lord says, we need to release our children. Hey, obey the Lord, don't obey me. That's the, the spiritual family must come first. The spiritual father must come first. So, obedience to the will of God must be supreme. It is the will of God and not genetics that is to determine our allegiances. Now, as we think about all these things, as we think about Jesus' mother and brothers outside, and, and we think about Jesus saying, whoever does the will of God is my mother and my brothers, and there's, there's a, another false doctrine that gets exposed. You see, there's this false doctrine that if you pray to Mary that Mary will get Jesus to do that thing. And it's just a false doctrine because we see throughout Jesus' earthly ministry, Jesus does his own thing. He doesn't listen to what his mother has to say because he's getting his directions from his heavenly father. His earthly mother is not over him. And so if Jesus didn't um, submit to his earthly mother during his humiliation, during the incarnation... Now that Jesus has been given the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess, now that Jesus has been exalted to the right hand of the Father and is waiting there till everything is put under his feet, how can we think that praying to Mary can get things done? It doesn't make any sense. The scriptures make it clear that we're to go directly to God the Father through Jesus Christ. That there are no intermediaries. There's, there's no mediator between God and man except for the man Christ Jesus. And so we are not to pray to anyone besides a triune God. Not to Mary and not to any saints and not to anything. The fact of the matter is a triune God, the, the three persons of the Trinity are the only ones worthy of our prayers. And they will not be swayed by any person who you know, can kind of get our prayers in there and make it happen. So that's another false doctrine that unfortunately many people have submitted to. And, and so we need to just remove those things. They have no basis in Scripture. They're not the truth. Now, let's spend some time um, as we move on breaking down the words, whoever does the will of God that we find in verse 35 of Mark chapter 3. And and first of all, the, the word whoever here tells us that the invitation is open for anyone to become a member of Jesus' family. That's awesome. It's a wonderful truth that Jesus says, whoever does the will of God is my brothers and my mother. 
So Jesus is saying, whoever can be a part of the spiritual family, whoever wants to. This should remind us of the wonderful truth taught in John chapter 3, verse 16. It said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And you think about it, you think about um, maybe in these hard economic times that we're in, and we think, well, maybe if I could just get myself adopted into some rich and powerful family. If I could somehow, you know, get myself adopted into some rich and powerful family, then everything would be okay, and I could live in a big mansion, I could drive fancy cars, and I could be provided for, you know, and that would be awesome. It would be wonderful. You know, that's probably not going to happen for any of us. I don't know what the odds are for us getting adopted into some rich and powerful family, but the fact of the matter is, though, that is not likely to happen. The fact of the matter is the, the God who owns it all, the God of the universe, the, the God who created everything just with words, that he is willing to adopt you into his family. So think about that. And, and he's not willing to adopt you into a temporary mansion, but he's willing to adopt you into heaven. He's willing to give you a place that is going to last forever. He's willing to give you this eternal resurrected body. And so as we think about these wonderful truths, then that should help us in our witnessing and our praying for others of this invitation that whoever believes can be part of the family of God. That, that whoever trusts in Jesus Christ will be forgiven of their sins and have eternal life. And so it's a, a wonderful thing to think about. So this conflict between this spiritual family and physical family, what we can say to our physical family is, come on in. You are invited into the spiritual family. That there are plenty of good seats available. There are plenty of seats at the table. That you can come in to this family. That God the Father is willing to adopt anyone, whoever, who comes through his son, Jesus Christ. What a wonderful promise. Now, the second thing to note here, as we continue to explore the words, whoever does the will of God, is the word does. Whoever does the will of God. You see, the spiritual family that Jesus is referring to is made up of those who actually do the will of God. And so that's what we're going to start exploring now. There's so much to explore regarding this doing of the will of God. Not just simply knowing the will of God, but actually doing it. And so it all begins with what Jesus proclaimed in John 6, verse 40. So if you're kind of thinking it through yourself and trying to get a framework of what does it mean to do the will of God? Well, I'm going to give you some verses that kind of help you out in that area. But it all begins, the first doing of the will of God begins in John chapter 6, verse 40, where Jesus said these words, and this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up the last day. So the first step, please hear me, the first step in doing the will of God is believing in Jesus Christ. That's the first step. So if you're a person today and he says, oh, I want to start doing the will of God, and you have not yet believed, you've not yet been born again, you've not yet become a part of that spiritual family, the Heavenly Father as the head of that family, then I would encourage you, I would exhort you, I would implore you to believe. That's the first step. If you want to do the will of God, then believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will be born again by the Spirit the moment you believe. And you'll be accepted, adopted into the family of God. And so think about it this way. You know, maybe if you're um, one of those crazy people who actually likes running. And you like running, and so you register for a race. You know, and let's say, it's a, let's say it's, a, it's a reasonable race. It's a 5K. And what happens, as you register for your race, you get that number. You know, you get that number, and you pin it on your shirt. And so that's you're, now you're a part of the race. You're a part of the runners. You've been brought into that race but now that you're an official runner, at that point, though, the race has just begun. And so it is for when a person be believes. The moment you believe in Jesus Christ, it's almost like you get that, that number. And you pin it to your jersey. You're, you're, you're a member of the race. 
But now it's your job to run. So it is for us as believers. The moment we're born again, we've gotten our number. Now it's time to run the race. Now it's time to walk in that obedience. Now it's time to do those things that God has called us to do. You see, everyone who places their faith in Jesus Christ becomes a member of Jesus' family no matter what natural family they were born into. And so after that initial doing the will of God, of placing one's faith in the Lord Jesus, then it is time to continue doing the will of God as a good family member should. Now it's time to start doing the things that a good spiritual family member would do. It's time to start running that race now that you've gotten the number. Now with that said, I'd like to spend the rest of our time together exploring some of what the New Testament has to say about the will of God. You see, since Jesus said those who do the will of God are his family members, and since the subject of the will of God can be so confusing for us, it'd be helpful for us to spend some time focusing on this subject. Now I would encourage you, if you're taking notes, to write these down and kind of think them through, go back over them as you seek to really understand what the will of God is. So let's first turn to Acts chapter 7, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 7. Let's turn to Luke chapter 7, verses 29 and 30. And we're just going to kind of go through some of these. Luke 7, verses 29 through 30. We read, And when all the people heard him, heard Jesus, even tax collectors justified God, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. So here we see that these Pharisees and lawyers, they rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. In other words, they had rejected John the Baptist, and because they had rejected John the Baptist, they weren't able to receive Jesus. Their hearts were closed to truth. They were unwilling to receive the Messiah's forerunner, And so, therefore, they really couldn't understand and believe in the Messiah himself. So what we have here, as related to the will of God, is that the will of God is, part of doing the will of God is receiving those whom God sends. You see, as as we want to do the will of God, then we receive those whom God sends. Part of that's reading the scriptures, right? We receive, you know, Moses and the things Moses said. And we receive Jeremiah, the things that Jeremiah said. We receive Paul and things that Paul said. These are all people who have been sent by God. And as we receive them, as we believe them, we're doing the will of God. So those who believed in John the Baptist and what he was saying were open to the Messiah. Okay? And so part of doing the will of God is receiving those whom God sends. That's important for us to understand. Let's move now to Ephesians chapter 6. I want to look at verses 5 through 8. Ephesians 6 verses 5 through 8. Continue looking at what doing the will of God means. It says, Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and sincerity of heart as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. So here we have some, some more insight into what doing the will of God means. Well, doing the will of God, we do it from the heart. In other words, the will of God must be done from the heart. It must not be a hypocritical show. So part of doing the will of God is just saying, I'm going to do whatever God says. And I'm going to do it with the right heart. I'm not going to be hypocritical. I'm not going to pretend to do it. I'm not going to just put on a face. But in reality, God is not looking only at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. So if we want to be those people who do the will of God, then we need to actually do it with a heart that is right. Now, maybe you find yourself in a place where you're just begrudgingly doing things and don't really want to do it. Then spend some time praying. Ask the Lord to give you that heart that you might obey Him rightly. Let's turn next to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So we continue turning right. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 1 through 8. And Paul writes, Finally, brethren, I, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Here it is. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. So this sanctification is this 
that, is, that, that progressively being set apart to the Lord, becoming more and more like Christ, being more and more useful to Him. And part and parcel of that is abstaining from sexual immorality, staying away from illicit sexuality. It says that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this manner, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. And so it's basically God's will that we have nothing to do with sexual immorality, that we stay away from that. And I don't, I don't know if there's a bigger place where the scriptures and, you know, human culture disagree more than when it comes to sexual expression. I mean, we know that our culture seems, it deifies sexual expression. That seems to be the highest thing about any person is their sexual expression. And the scriptures say no. That we're to flee from all forms of sexual immorality. That anything outside of a, a, a one man, one woman marriage, that any kind of sexual conduct outside of that place is sin. It's outside of the will of God. And so that is a, a huge division between what the scriptures say, what the Lord says, and what the world teaches. So it's important for us, if we want to be those people, who, you know, that are, are good family members, that we're doing what our Father says, that we need to flee from sexual immorality. We need to stay far from that. Next we have in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 through 18. So if you would turn now to 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 through 18, it says, Rejoice always, and pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So this is God's will. It's real straightforward. It's a challenging few verses, but I love the clarity it brings that it's God's will that we should always rejoice. It's God's will that we should pray without ceasing, and it's God's will that we should give thanks in everything. And that's challenging for us, right? In the difficult times and all things that kind of we've gone through as a nation and as in the world lately, but we're still to do this. We're to find those things that we're to rejoice in, we're to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And as we do that, we're going to be those faithful family members. Let's move now to the end of near the end of our Bible to 1 Peter this time. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. It says, For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, not using yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bond servants of God. So it's God's will here, we see in these verses, that by doing the right things, we'd silence unbelievers and that we would use our freedom in a way that honors God. So it's important for us to understand that as we do God's will, as we seek to be obedient children of the Father, doing things the way that he would have us to do them, we'll be able to silence those unbelievers. And then hopefully as they're silenced, they would be reflective and come to salvation. Also in 1 Peter, and this time in 1 Peter 4, verse 19, says, let the, Therefore let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to Him in doing good as to a faithful Creator. That is a tough verse because it's a reminder that the will of God for our lives may involve suffering. That it may be that God wants us to suffer for His purposes, to grow us, to mature us, to teach us, to be a witness to others, whatever purposes he may have in suffering to build us into the character of Christ, then what we have is that, that as we suffer according to the will of God, that we're faithful to him in that. And so it's important for us to, rem to remember that, that, that suffering may be a part of God's will for our lives. Now finally, we, we turn to 1 John. This is the last verse we'll look at before we wrap up this study. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, very helpful. John writes, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. 
And whoever, I'm sorry, and the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. So here John is, is reminding us that, hey, the, the, that when we love the Father, the love of the world is going to fade away. And that we're not to love those things in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, those things that we saw way back in Genesis 3 at the fall. Uh, and, and because all of that is passing away. All of that, all the things that chase after in this world are temporary. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. So we have this wonderful promise for those who are of the family of God, for those who have trusted in Jesus Christ, that we are going to abide or live with God forever. It's exciting. You know, no matter how tightly we hold on to these things in this world, they are going to fade away. They're going to break down. We're going to become dissatisfied with them. We just, we just can't hold on. Everything in this world is temporary. But those who do the will of God, those who are part of that family, they're going to abide with Him forever. And that's super exciting and an encouraging thing to realize that though things are uncertain in this world and things are fading away, that those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, we're going to abide with God forever. That's good news. Now, as we close, I want to leave you with three application questions. Number one is, are you releasing the members of your family to serve the Lord? Are you releasing the members of your family to serve the Lord? You see, Jesus' mother and brothers and sisters, they wanted to kind of get Jesus and, and do what they thought was right. They were unwilling to release him to serve his father. So let us not be like them. Let us be those who release our family members to serve the Lord in the way that he has called them to serve. Number two, are you praying for and witnessing to your unbelieving family members? You know, I have to believe that there are many of you who are watching this or listening to this that have unbelieving family members and maybe you're tired and you're frustrated and you're, I've done all I can and I just don't ever think it's going to happen. Just keep praying. Please keep praying. Please keep witnessing. Please keep trusting the Lord and you be obedient to the will of God. Continue to love them and seeking that they not only be a part of your physical family but also a part of your spiritual family. Then finally, are you seeking to do the will of the Lord, knowing that you have many spiritual brothers and sisters who are doing the same? Please be encouraged today. You're not the only one. You may feel isolated today. You may feel separate today. And that's understandable, especially in the world that we're living in. And it's easy to get online and read all the bad news and ungodly legislation and all those kind of things. It's the, the devil wants you to believe, wants me to believe that there's just a few of us and that we're ultimately going to lose. But the scriptures make it clear that there are many brothers and sisters, spiritual brothers and sisters throughout this world that are seeking the Father, seeking to do the will of God. And so it's important for us to remember that. And for us to be those spiritual brothers and sisters who do our part, to be those, those runners in the race who run, who not merely have a number, but actually participate, actually run the race, and then in doing so, we're going to encourage our spiritual brothers and sisters around us to continue doing the will of God as well. So keep seeking the Lord. Keep seeking to do His will. And I pray that you would have a wonderful day. Let's pray. Lord, do you thank you for this time and thank you for your grace and for your mercy. I thank you for the fact that you use us um, no matter uh, who we are, Lord, and, and how much we fail. So I thank you for adopting us into our family. And I pray once again, Lord, for those unbelieving family members, those physical family members that we have, that, that you would bring them to yourself, that you draw them to salvation. And again, I pray once again for um, the moms, Lord, that they would have a wonderful Mother's Day and that you would uh, just have your hand upon them. Lord, encourage them um, and that great work that they do. Just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Shadow every test I'm hanging on I'm leaning 
Trust your name.